You're listening to Two Smart Assets with Chris Thompson and Danny Nichols. This is your source for passive investing in real estate syndications. It's time for us to gain knowledge and take action. So let's go. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. This is the Two Smart Assets Podcast. I am your host, Danny Nichols, here once again with my co-host, Chris Thompson. Hey, it's good to see you, Danny, man. Good to see you too, man. What a show we have this week for our listeners. Tell them what we're talking about today, sir. Okay. So I'm excited to uh, bring this person to you. We talked to uh, Savannah Arroyo. She's the net worth nurse. Savannah is a full-time registered nurse in LA. Uh, you know, Today, we took a deep dive into how her skills in healthcare have translated into becoming a successful active real estate investor. Uh, we also talked about why she chose to switch from single family homes to multifamily apartment syndications. And then we also talked a little bit about her first syndication and the steps that she took to make that happen. Yeah, Savannah is awesome. And I think this show is uh, is great as well. It was a great chat and uh, super excited to to get into it. But before we do, I just want to give a quick shout out to all our listeners. We really appreciate you tuning in. And if you haven't done so already, please make sure to subscribe to the show and leave us a rating and written review. really helps us grow the podcast, attract more guests, and ultimately provide better information for everyone listening. If you're a passive investor or looking to get into passive investing, then head over to our website at twosmartassets.com. There you can grab our guide for passive investing in apartment syndications. It's just a great introduction into the world of passive investing in apartment syndications. So make sure to check that out. Also, grab our apartment syndication sample bill. This is going to help you get comfortable with looking at this type of investment. So when the real opportunity is coming your way, you'll be ready. If you have any questions about what's in either of these resources, drop us a line anytime on our website's contact us page, or you can message us on Instagram. Facebook or Twitter, posting some great content on there. So make sure to follow us and start connecting. All right, let's get into the show. What's going on, everybody? Today's guest is Savannah Arroyo. Savannah, the net worth nurse, is a full time registered nurse in Los Angeles, California. She uses her skills as a leader in healthcare operations to manage multifamily syndications. Savannah also helps busy medical professionals provide or create passive income through real estate investing. Savannah, it's great to see you. Welcome to the show. Yeah, I'm super stoked to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, we've been looking forward to this for a little while now, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, we definitely want to hear more about your story. So let's just kind of just start there. We know you do have an interesting story. So tell the listeners a bit more about your background and how you got into real estate. Yeah, nursing is is my career. I, it's always been my calling and my passion. I graduated from nursing school up north um, in Sacramento, worked in a couple different specialties, different departments, moved down here to Los Angeles, went back to school and got my master's in nursing leadership and administration. I really just love the operation side of things in healthcare. Um, so right now I'm doing that. I oversee multiple departments at a hospital here in LA. Um, I dove into real estate, got bit by the real estate bug pretty bad um, while I was on maternity leave with my second daughter, just at home watching YouTube videos, um, discovering financial freedom, passive income, how to generate wealth. Um, real estate was a huge uh, catalyst for that. Uh, started looking into different niches, uh, what I wanted to do. Um, my husband and I kind of figured out a goal plan. And we started investing in single family homes over in Georgia, across the country. And then shortly after we switched into multifamily. And that was primarily because it seemed like every podcast I was listening to or people I was talking to, the one thing that they wish they would have done was scale sooner. Um, And multifamily really just provides a huge opportunity to scale in the real estate business. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right there. And you know, you kind of touched on it that you began your investing career with single family homes. So there's something I want to talk about there because we did something similar. We first started off with single family homes, you know, buy and hold, stuff like that. So I want to talk about a little bit about that journey. In terms of when you, you know, your kind of path through investing in single family homes, did you take anything away from there, challenges you had to overcome that really kind of pushed you further into going to multifamily? Um, I would say just to get specific about what you wanted to do, uh, we didn't necessarily have any major challenges. We initially wanted to do the Burr method. That was very appealing to us in terms of making our capital stretch for us and to accumulate that wealth and that snowball. Um, But overseeing a complete renovation across the country just wasn't really in our comfort level. It, it seems like a lot of work and we were both already doing full-time jobs. We have two young kids at home. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old here. So it just wasn't really, we felt like it was going to stress us out and it wasn't going to be fun. So we looked into uh, multifamily and just kind of what that entails and 
syndications and being a passive investor. And initially we were wanting to passively invest in a syndication. And then the more we started looking into it, we're like, this is super cool. We want to operate these. These are, this is, I mean, it seemed ironically a lot of similarities between what I do at work in terms of overseeing different projects, facilitating and collaborating with people to roll out process improvement stuff. So it was very similar to what I was doing. And I was like, I think, I think we can do this. This seems pretty cool. And um, we educated ourselves more on the process, talked to a bunch of lawyers, made sure we were doing everything by the book, legally sound, and we love it. We're stoked off it. That's awesome. And I kind of want to dive into something you touched on there was, you know, your, your, the skills that you have in your, in your W2 job, you know, as a nurse, they've, they've translated into, you know, kind of what you're doing as a multifamily active investor. Can you talk a little bit about more about that? Some of the skills that have actually translated and some, you know, the real benefit of having those already like pre-made basically, and you're just sliding these over into this new area. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I think you'd be surprised really in any profession, the similarities that you found. I mean, it's building a business. Um, What I was doing in healthcare in terms of operation was really the big projects and the projects with a lot of moving pieces and the collaboration efforts of getting everyone on board. As the full facilitator of some of these process improvement projects, I was collabing with the CFO and then the CNO for certain approval parts of it, collaborating with the doctors in terms of implementing new workflows. And then obviously with the staff and the nurses and the frontline healthcare workers as to what would be feasible in terms of changing things. And then obviously with the patient in mind and providing the best patient care. So a lot of different moving pieces in that, that really applied to what you do in a syndication. You're dealing with brokers and property managers, and you have your CPA and your investors and, um, and a lot of things that you need to coordinate. And it's a constant follow-up. I mean, any major project that you implement, even in a W-2 job that a lot of people could relate to is deadlines and the follow-up of like making sure people are doing their part of the project and um, just really overseeing that. So, so, and that's, that's amazing. I think there's a lot of good stuff there and you make a lot of great points in terms of, you know, cause I found that something similar to myself, you know, I've worked in uh, as an engineer for a while and a lot of the things that I've, I did before or I'm doing in my current job, they kind of translate a little bit and I've been able to use that, but there, there, I have to say there are a few areas that I wasn't, uh, that weren't translated, you know, they didn't transfer. And so I had to learn these new skills. Have you found that to be true? And you know, becoming an active investor, like, Hey, there are skills that I need to learn. And if there are, what are those? Yes. I think the biggest thing for me was the legal side of things. That was honestly what scared me the most of how do you legally raise money? And, um, in terms of investors getting their returns, what is promised to them and what liability you own, you hold as an operator in control of people's money for these large investments? What, what risk am I putting myself at by doing these large deals? So that was a huge hurdle that my husband and I really overcame together. And we were on all the calls with the lawyers together. I purchased a couple real estate legal books that were written by CPAs in the real estate world and talking to other syndicators who have done it and kind of what they've learned along the process on how you can potentially solicit deals and the wrong way to do things. I think learning from people's mistakes was my, what I wanted to do. I'm like, what did everyone else do that? Like either ended up, you know, in jail or what, and what, how can I not do that? Like, what do I need to not do in order to make this work? Yeah, that makes complete sense. And I think that's a, that's a great tip for anybody listening, especially if they're trying to get into being becoming an active uh, investor. So in terms of that, I kind of want to roll on and keep rolling that on. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we talked about education earlier and, you know, there's a lot of different moving pieces of this, you know, becoming mm-hmm. an active syndicator and, you know, the, the law side of it and, you know, CPA is just one or two different top areas. What are some of the best resources that you use beyond, you know, just other people that really helped you get you educated and feel like you're ready to just tackle this and get into this, um, this niche? Yeah, a couple, a couple podcasts. So it seems like any big um, major podcasts, I know you guys have like a CPA on there occasionally or different networking groups and webinars. Some people will bring on CPAs because a lot of us have questions for them. So I made sure to be a, a part of every one of those. I would scroll through podcasts and find which host they had on that was a CPA. And I would listen to that episode. Um, a couple uh, big books out there. One I got was um, Kim Lisa. She's a CPA in the field. Um, it's like syndicating legally, mm. raising money legally. And, um, another one I just got, um, 
a bigger pockets book brand. I'm forgetting, I'm blinking on the title of it, but, uh, researching those things. And I know it can be hard that we discovered very quickly when you start talking to actual lawyers about it, they're charging you every minute. So kind of trying to figure out your answers to these questions without hiring on a lawyer and using some of these other resources like purchasing their books. I mean, even Kim Lisa, she has a whole free consultation call. There's a bunch of resources on her website and educating yourself before you get a lawyer involved in your deal. And then obviously when we did our syndication and we had our lawyer who was um, drafting the PPM and doing, going over all the SEC rules with us, we were very attentive, taking notes on those meetings and just soaking up everything we could. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that, there's a lot there. And I think that, you know, podcasts, webinars, you know, all that stuff is great. And I think we found, especially when we first started getting into this, because we started as passive investors. Well, I mean, mm after the single family thing, but we started as past investors. And uh, what we found was really the, the biggest thing for us, we could sit there and I could read book after book. I could listen to podcasts because, you know, there's a hundred different podcasts mm-hmm. and, you know, all of this stuff's out there and it's great information, but that only provides so much, you know? So mm-hmm. what we found that really accelerated our progress is connecting with other people, like you were saying earlier, you know, yeah. where, you know, whether or not you've joined a mentorship or you're part of a group or whatever, but it's just going out there and networking and talking to those people who are actually doing this thing and have done it, you know, have had some, some speed bumps and they've overcome those challenges. We found like that's gold. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Do that. I mean, that's the number one thing you can do. So in terms of that, we've talked to a lot of people who become active investors, but most of the people that we talk to usually do so through a group. Have you, have you, did you join a group or are you kind of just self-educating and let's take off with this thing? Yeah, I joined a group. Um, I, j- I have a couple masterminds that I'm a part of. Um, I actually do have a mentor advisor coach type thing that we signed up for just because when we were making the transition from single family to multifamily, it was, I mean, there are a lot of similarities. Of course, it's real estate and the transaction process overall is, is pretty similar. Um, the capital raising was the biggest difference, although I know a lot of people do that for flipping and that sort of thing. So it wasn't necessarily just for commercial that that ap- applies to. But um, we really, in terms of our underwriting, when we were running the numbers on the properties, that's where we really wanted support on, hey, are all these numbers looking good? Is it accurate to be raising rents this much? And then even without the coach, you learn that you can run those numbers by your property manager and they should be able to give you insight into what's feasible in your business plan of in terms of raising rents and overseeing a renovation and that sort type of thing. Um, but just for us having that extra set of eyes on our underwriting really gave us the confidence to start submitting offers and do the deal and put ourselves out there. That is awesome. We love to hear that. That's uh, that's great news. Um, so I kind of want to talk about, uh, you know, syndication. There's, there's, there's a number of different ways to get into multifamily. There's different ways to tackle multifamily deals. I mean, you could have gone out and just bought like, you know, a smaller unit property and multifamily and it would have done exactly what you needed to do if that was your goal. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I want to talk about why you chose syndication and, you know, instead of just going a different route, maybe just JVing or just buying smaller multifamily. Why did you choose syndication? A couple of different reasons. I mean, like I said, we were originally going to do the passive investor side, but then when we saw that this is something we could do and kind of make it work for us, we it's when you can raise money to do bigger deals, you're just overall kind of mitigating more risk with greater returns. I mean, the bigger deals out there, not all of them, but the bigger the deals, it, it kind of mitigates that risk. And the more we were talking to people, it was just such a service to provide people. I know a lot of our friends and family weren't really aware of real estate and investing. And a lot of people feel like they can't get into it because either they don't want to manage properties, they don't want to oversee that stuff. And syndication allows people to get in into the real estate, receive the same benefits that an oper- operator would receive, essentially the same returns, tax advantages, even as a passive investor. And at this point, we're really just spreading the word. I mean, just educating people. Um, I'm, I'm speaking a lot to medical professionals and physicians and nurses in the field who are wanting to do something with their money, invest in something besides the stock market, but don't really know where to start. And honestly, a lot of people out there don't know where to start with real estate. And syndications really provide people the opportunity to passively invest and get as involved in the process as you want and crunch the numbers and ask your operators questions or kind of sit back and just let your money work for you and have your operator do everything. I love the fact that you bring up, you know, educating others. Cause that's, I mean, that's the whole reason why we started this podcast is just, is just to just to educate others. Cause when we found out about syndications, passive investing in syndications, light bulb went off, you know, I'm working, yeah. I'm working over like a hundred hours a week 
Right. Uh, you know, I got, what am I going to do with this money? I'm trying to be, you know, I'm trying to do single family over here, but it's going okay. But there's, there's a better way to do this. And that was it. And so mm-hmm. when I found it, it was like one of those things, like maybe Chris and I talk about this all the time. I wish we would have learned about this long ago. And, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> it was just, just one of those things. But, uh, yeah. So the fact that you're spreading the word is, uh, it's pretty great. So Chris, you got I, some? I'm curious, like, well, I, I don't necessarily want to change the subject, but I like to pivot here. Like, you know, you, you go through, you spend all this time, like educating yourself and really digging in, you know, before, uh, you know, before you get going. And, and I realize, you know, there is that fear of like, I need to do this right. I don't want to get in trouble. And, and plus we're dealing with other people's money. So that's its own separate fear in itself. You know, once you reach like a certain point and you're ready, whether you have a deal yet or not, I'm not sure, but like, you know, you're, you're ready to begin pulling the trigger. And then I'm curious, like about your, like about your capital raising, like how, like, how are you like, cause I know we got to get creative a lot to just to source that money and source that capital. I'm curious, like how you went about that, like maybe with your first deal or how you got that ball rolling mm-hmm. once you're ready, I guess. Yeah. So in terms of taking that first step, I think that was huge of having my husband on board with this because we bounce ideas off each other. And I think that even if I had all my ducks in the row and everything was lined up and I was ready to go, it would have been hard for me to take that plunge without him by my side, having somewhat knowledge about it and being like, all right, we're doing it together, like a team team thing. And I know a lot of people partner up or they have that support person that really just kind of gives them the motivation and the extra push to be like, you can do this. You know, even before my first presentation that I had, I was super nervous. My husband left me a little note, like you can do it. Talk slow. You got this, you know, that sort of thing. And that, that helps me having that support in terms of taking that first push. Um, in terms of capital raising that side of things, it was a little bit difficult for me to, to go into that realm because I'm known with all my friends and family as a nurse. And as people knew we were investing in real estate, but they were like, wait, so now you're syndicating deals and what exactly are you doing? You're buying apartment complexes. Like, what is that? How does it work? And it was a lot of questions. And I think a lot of skepticism, I think a couple of my aunts asked me if I was doing a pyramid scheme and (laughs) just like, wait, what are you doing? And like, for obvious reasons, I get everyone's a little bit skeptical at first. And especially when you're so excited about it, because we're like, oh my God, look at what we're doing. It totally seems like a pyramid scheme, right? But it, <laughs> it seems the more you... true at times. <laughs> I, right. Some people are out there doing it. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I can't attest to that, but um, it was really just being honest and transparent. And I know when I made the hurdle into the capital raising side, originally we were planning to outsource that and partner with people who would do the capital raising for us. And although we'd still be open to deals like that in the future, we're actually talking to someone about doing that right now on one of our upcoming deals. But it was kind of like, this is a part of building a business. A part of a building a business is creating a brand, putting yourself out there, talking to people, networking. Social media is, is inevitable right now. It's 2020. Like if your business is not on social media, I mean, it, you're just not going to get that traction that anyone would get. I mean, even before I go to a new restaurant or anywhere, I'm like looking at their Instagram page to see like what's going on over there, what people are tagging. So um, I was initially a little bit hesitant about that, but it was kind of like, all right, let's get out there. You know, we're providing people with the service. We're, we're getting people great returns. We're educating on them about what we're doing. And I think putting out content helps. Um, I know for our first syndication, we had a lot of investors that were coming in and they didn't really know what it was. And we were diverting them to other educational resources out there. Oh, check out this book, check out this blog. Now we've started to create our own blogs, our own videos. And although we still encourage our investors to check out other educational resources, of of course, you shouldn't be getting all your education from one sole person, but now we've started to create that for investors. So it's us, our words coming through. And I think the more people get familiar with you and what you're doing, everyone's personality kind of appeals to different investors. And I think that's uh, it's huge. You know, you're talking about being on social media. It's 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 challenge of, in itself. You know, and then also creating that content. That's a whole nother beast. I mean, you, if if you're not used to doing that, it's. I mean, the people that don't know, you don't know. You know, it's <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a whole nother thing. And we found that as as a challenge, just you know, for this podcast and other things. Like, man, it's that's it's work, and you know, it's just it's another so it's just another work. piece of it. But you have to do it right. Kind of like you're saying, yeah. like if you're if you're not on social media, if you're not providing some sort of 
you know, presence to people to, to know who you are and really kind of understand, you know, what you're doing, you're, you're not going to get that traction. So yeah, uh, exactly. I think, I think that's massive. I do want to talk a little bit about your first deal. Um, you know, that first syndication. Can you tell us a little bit about that and some of the details associated with the property? And all this yeah, stuff? it was a 12 unit up in Oregon. Um, we were still looking in Georgia, but my parents live up in Oregon. So more out of curiosity than anything, we were looking up there for deals, just seeing what, what Oregon had to offer. Um, we cre- created a great relationship with a broker up there, a young, hungry guy. He was sending us all these pocket listings super motivated to start selling stuff. And we just created a great relationship with them. We were very responsive. We you know, showed him that we were ready to pull the trigger. It wasn't something that we were waiting on or wishy-washy on. We were there, we were reviewing things in a good turnaround time, getting him good feedback. And we were really specific about what we were looking for, a certain unit size. At that time, we were looking for 10 to 20 units, a smaller type deal that we could outsource to close family and friends at the time, um, a certain pr- uh, price point and a strong value add. So by the time he gave us a deal, it was exactly what we were looking for. We pulled the trigger on it, submitted a contract, I think the same night he gave us the deal. And it was really just because we were in open, constant communication with each other. It was a good, a strong value add. Uh, rents were twenty five percent below market. There was an option to turn a storage unit into a studio. Uh, we vetted out that business plan with a property manager up there. She had great experience in the area. We really just hit it off well with her. She was born and raised there. She looked at our numbers, um, said that it was on track in or in terms of raising rent by what we wanted to do every year to meet our exit strategy at year three. And although it's a very um, a smaller cash flowing deal just because of the huge value add component. It was, we're able to exit the deal within three years and then give our investors a pretty good lump sum. So um, it appealed to the investors that wanted those type of returns. Yeah, it's always good to be able to find investors who are looking for a specific deal. And I think the uh, one of the things that you really touched on that I think is, is just key is when you're looking for anybody who's looking for deals, especially if you're trying to reach out uh, via a broker or anything like that, whether they're giving you pocket listings or having you on, on market deals is the point about being specific, know what you're looking for, you know, I mean, know exactly the property type, know what you're looking for and be able to uh, communicate that to somebody so they can help you. And then, yes. and then, you know, hand in hand with that is being responsive. So if they're going to bring you something, be responsive, you know, I think those are, those are two great, two great points. And I'm, I'm glad you brought those up and, um, excited about your first deal. That's, that's awesome. Uh, congratulations on that. That's a, that's a, that's a good deal. So, you know, we got a, we got a new year coming up. People change goals, people pivot, people do other things. What does it look like for you and your company going forward in terms of what type of deals you're looking for and what market you're looking to um, be a part of? Yeah, we're going to keep on keeping on. We just submitted an LOI up in Oregon in the same, in the similar market to our first deal. Uh, just our broker gave us another hot deal that looked great. So i um, probably going to start capital raising for that. And then um, continuing to look in, we, lo- we like Georgia still. We, we look over there occasionally. Um, Boise, New Mexico, Reno. We're looking in some of those markets for different reasons. Uh, we're staying in course with what with strong value add deals, exit strategy around five, three to five years for our investors. Um, we have some parameter in in regards to the returns we're expecting for them. And that's pretty much what we're doing. We continue to look for deals, find them, raise money for them, and close them. Do you have a specific amount of units that you'd like to be in between? Do you have anything like that or um, that's so dependent on which market we're looking sure. at. Um, all of them are pretty similar. We're looking about at the 50 to 100 right now in each market, give or take. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, we're excited for you and we hope that you uh, definitely have a lot of success this this coming year. And, uh, you know, we've loved to learn your, learn your story, learn more about you. And before we get out of here, we just want to sh- take some time and shine the spotlight on you, Savannah. So tell us a little more about you and your company. Yeah, I just, I love connecting with people. Um, If you're even remotely interested in real estate, please reach out to me. I love talking real estate. You can find me um, on social media handle under the Net Worth Nurse, under LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, the Net Worth Nurse. And that's also my website too, thenetworthnurse.com. Like I said, I started pushing out a lot of cool educational stuff on there. So go and check it out. And then also if you want to email me, Savannah at the nurse.com. Awesome. Awesome. We're going to make sure to put all that stuff uh, in the show notes, by the way, love that name net worth <laughs> nurse. That's a, that's awesome. R- really, really like that, but we're gonna make sure to put all that stuff in the show notes. So anybody who 
wants to reach out and learn more about you, they can do so. So, um, Great. Savannah, really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, love talking to you. Hope to connect, keep connecting going forward. So, my you. pleasure. Thanks, guys. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode. Head over to iTunes to subscribe to the show. And while you're there, we'd really appreciate you leaving a rating and written review. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, connect with us on social media or through our website at twosmartassets.com. We look forward to speaking to each and every one of you. Talk to you soon.